How are you today? Good. Good. How are you? We are recording. My name's Bob. I talk funny. Oh, I'll get to that. Um, yes, I have uh, many letters after my name. Uh, by way of introducing myself, I'll share with me this with you. So, I used to be like Gene Wilder, now I'm more like Peter Boyle. <laughs> if you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where passion sits? <laughs> Alright. Different Oops. <laughs> So. Yeah, I have a uh, degenerative neuromotor thing going on. That's what's happening with me. Body slowing down, brain still works great. So I plotted uh, uh, my uh, changes on the Wilder Boyle scale. So there's our boy Gene. There's a uh, Peter Boyle in a movie called Swashbuckler, a favorite of mine. And that's young me wearing a horrible 80s jacket. And that is current me, I'm um, slowing down. So those are many of the industries that I've done simulation in. I've had like 12 professional jobs. Um, I've traveled over like four continents, been in every state, every province, but uh, Nunavut, hoping to get up there. Um, so let me ask you a question. When you think of simulation, what are the first things that come to your mind? Defense industry. That's a big one. I think of it as its experimental or scientific purpose. Any simulation is an attempt to predict certain results and then make a decision about what to do next. Decision sport, awesome. Well, I, I do computer simulations for math equations, yeah, like yeah, calculus right. and all that. Right, right. I make a product that I don't need to test forever. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah, my current work is more about the traffic simulation. Mm. So from my point of view, it's just a concept to recreate that kind of situation and the purpose is mainly for the forecasting. Right, gotcha. Cool. All right, so I talk about all those things. Nobody said the holodeck, <laughs> the matrix, right. anything from sci-fi, all that part we could have, of it. But <laughs> right. <laughs> So there's three major classes of simulation. You've talked about two, and that's continuous, which are based on uh, systems described by differential equations, and also discrete events, which are based on events you describe qualitatively that are processed in time order. Now, the time jumps can be arbitrary, right? You can have one that's, you know, a millisecond, one the next jumps an hour. They can be anything. Continuous simulations tend to be done on constant time steps. Now, obviously, there's a lot of variations in mixes in that. Before there was enough uh, computer power to do these things, they used to do analog simulations, both mechanical and electrical. So as many of you know, um, that's an example of a mechanical simulator. Um, the original link simulator, they've now grown into these monstrous computer graphic, force feedback, you know, gimbling, pivoting, um, crazy simulators. But that's where it all started. And they would add pieces to that, for example, 
when they were planning bombing runs and training the pilots over Japan, they built models of Japan in 3D, filmed from cameras they had flying over those would-be um, um, simulations, right? And then they attached those to these things uh, for bombers. So there has been a lot of things happen. Now, as you know, there are um, a lot of analogs between electrical systems, linear and rotational mechanical systems, um, thermal systems, and also hydraulic systems. The same uh, types of equations are used to analyze uh, all of them. And this is all for continuous type simulation. So I learned about analog simulation using these electrical circuits when I worked at Westinghouse with guys that have been doing it forever. We simulated nuclear power plants. And they used to do um, these simulations with actual circuits. And they'd hook those to button switches, dials, and whatever on uh, control panels to try to simulate what would happen. That's a more complex version of the same information. This uh, presentation is on my website if you want to go into more detail. Obviously, hybrid simulations are possible. So applications for this, um, design and sizing, figure out how big something has to be, how many facilities, uh, what equipment you need to get the throughput you want. Also, uh, security and event planning, that would be more discrete event simulation. The secret service uses a simulation to plot out their security, and I help build that. Um, operations research for things like aircraft use and maintenance to figure out the balance between what you need for parts labor in different specialties, time, um, various services, everything else. Real-time control, I did model predictive simulation to control steel reheat furnaces and induction melting furnaces. Operator training for nuclear power plants drivers, pilots, maintainers, everything else. Risk analysis, economic analysis, impact analysis. All those, uh, you basically attach monetary values or other kind of output values to every event um, and figure out if I change this or that, you know, what's gonna be the result. Um, there are some architectural considerations in building simulations. I've done all these, so. That's a continuous simulation of a piece of steel being heated in a furnace. So that's the bottom surface there. It's sitting on a hearth, and you can imagine uh, radiative heat transfer coming in from the other three sides. What you're doing is looking at a cross section heating up from the top. And that is a discrete event simulation, something I wrote in JavaScript because it makes a nice uh, web demo. All right, 
So if you want a continuous simulation, you go ahead and write a series of differential equations, and then you rearrange terms to isolate the driving things or factors on one side of the equation and the variables updating in time on the other side. Question. There Question? You just gave me an idea and I wondered if it was feasible. Will you talk about, uh, that was a Wien's right? differential equations and rearranging terms. It struck me that it's very similar to numerical computer coding and manufacturing. And it made me wonder whether 3D printing, for example, could be a sort of simulation of its own. If you wanted to actually, in other words, if you weren't happy with just the mathematical model, but you actually wanted a 3D version, it struck me you could do that. Yes. I mean, who would want to, but I mean, you could. It seems like you could. They do that, um, making what they call them um, test runs or yeah. uh, okay. test pieces of things. That's a kind of simulation. Okay. I have a slide later okay. that is other context for a simulation. I'll tell you now. So it's, uh, if you automate a process, for example, if you have all this paperwork that's going through a company, they know where it's gonna go, they right. know what has to be done, they know what information they need, what drives decisions, routing, and so on. So if you map that all out and figure out what can be automated, for example, if you scan um, all the documents, then you don't have to carry them around anymore. Um, you just um, um, have a computer move the images. What you're doing is simulating, in a sense, all the stuff that humans used to do. And just to continue your thought, that old discipline that used to be called operations research, which got kind of phased out as the computers took over, that's really what they, they were doing those analyses you just talked about. Yeah. They'd look at a workflow, they'd abstract it, they'd do a flow chart or something, and they'd say, okay, here's the bottleneck, here's the It's still logic. called operations still? Okay. research. Okay. And a lot of it, um, simulation used to be a big part of that. That's right. Um, right. Nowadays, uh, a lot of it is more uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. machine learning, mm -hmm. still trying to solve the same problem. Okay. So in this case, we have a uh, heat storage term, a uh, um, radiative heat transfer term, a convective heat transfer term, a conductive term, and an induction term. So. Um, there's actually a series of blog posts that go through how all that's done in detail. Um, more than you want to know, certainly, <laughs> but it's there. Mm -hmm. um, and then discrete event simulation is um, things happen at arbitrary rate of time intervals. So if you look at this, imagine I've got a queue of two items the queues move in that way. Then I have a new thing come in and I eventually pick things off the queue. Um, I process these um, in whatever order they happen. And you can see um, the way that's all done. There's a blog post about that. There's also 91 blog posts and counting talking about how I built the simulation that uh, uh, you saw before in Blue again, actually. So that's a running example in 2D and 3D. 
So ideally, uh, you've got stuff coming in, waiting in queues, waiting in sub queues. You've got parking lots that split off elements. They rejoin, they go to exits. So that's uh, the basic components of any discrete event simulation. They can all be made out of those basic components. Alright, um, much as I bagged out of the military industrial complex because I could, didn't want to spend whatever time I have left uh, trying to find uh, more efficient ways to murder people. Mm -hmm. um, I did work on the British Tried Rapier. So when I'm talking here, we talked about continuous versus discrete event. Now we'll talk about interactive versus fire and forget. So an interactive simulation is one in which you give it inputs, either yourself or other things happening out in the world that are sensed, or um, that you just hit a button, they run, they're done, off you go. That's a great stuff I understand. Is it really? Yeah. 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 But we had a whole room. One of the most modern and beautiful sounds here. in the world. It yeah. is in service in many nice. forms. Here, track rapier is in action with deep missiles at instant ready. So they, um, that helmet, I actually wore that. It was fairly new in the mid-80s. And it, um, you'd line it up, I think they show that process. And then um, you can, if you saw an aircraft, you could uh, hit a button and wherever the helmet was looking, the gunner's optics and the missiles split slew to that. And then the gunner could pick up the uh, uh, target and use the controls to track it. Wow, you wouldn't want to accidentally look the wrong way. No, that's just distracted by that rabbit running across the field. So you can't kick a million dollar tank. Each shell is like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, that's expensive training. Yours colored in the helmet. This side looks like me. It's amazing. This version of the system, one member of the crew wears a Ferranti helmet mounted sight. With this, if he can see a target, he only has to look at it to slave the main vehicle optical sight and the missile launcher to the target. The sight also has a thermal imager for use at night. Here, the target is being locked into the optical sight. After we All right, that bit, uh, you saw the previous optical thing. Um, they took, it's a whole column of stuff that goes up and down. The, um, they take that out and hook it to a simulator, a PC program, which feeds you the optics, right? Um, as a graphic simulation. And then you fire the uh, simulated missile and try to track it. So we trained on that thing for hours. Which the system is immune to countermeasures. <clears throat> so that's the gunner staging his hands are under underneath on a systems. joystick. So that's a man in the loop or a human in the loop interactive simulation. If you do something like that. Um, a fire and forget is we're just going to run it and see what happens, then we'll look at the results later. This is a, a simulation of the border crossing at Ambassador Bridge. It's the busiest commercial uh, border crossing in the country. 
goes between Detroit and Windsor, and it uh, actually goes south to north. Canada is south of uh, uh, the U.S. at that Excuse point. Me. So that's a discrete event simulation also. You can see it running. This is just a recording of the visual output that it generated. One of the things you'll see here is um, the uh, trucks used to have to go park in this parking lot. The drivers that have to go do their customs paperwork in the building here and there used to be huge backups and it got so bad that the trucks would eventually back up so no one could get through these booths here and you would see some of that. Um, they've since reorganized all of this so that doesn't happen. And uh, there was a cat type uh, uh, builder of these. We put various components down, hook them together with uh, uh, paths, and then uh, run the simulation. So another consideration is real time versus non real time. If you're doing something that's interactive, you probably want it to be real time. Like a nuclear power plant simulator, that is uh, Jack Lemon in the China Syndrome. That's the backup, I think that's Wilfred Brimley's head. Yeah. We used to build these things, so every single panel button switch dial knob input output recorder on dozens of panels potentially thousands of in io points they'd all be hooked to a computer and you had to simulate the fluid and electrical systems that drove all of that and model it all through first principles so that is real time. I'll go into a little bit more about how some of those things work. If you're simulating the formation of the universe or the solar system or something long hair like that, you ain't gonna do real time. You know, it would take a little while to run. <laughs> If you remember the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the Earth was actually an experiment to figure out the purpose of the universe, and it was actually run by rat, so that's a kind of simulation. Another thing is platform, uh, single platform versus distributed. Uh, many uh, simulations we use just run on a desktop like that, right? Uh, many others, for example, if you have a battlefield simulation if, or a multi-user dungeon um, on these online video games, there's some central server that's maintaining the overall reality, and then there might be full equipment um, simulators that are all interacting with that and with each other. Um, and in between those, you have a whole continuum. So um, the nuclear power plant simulators I worked on um, there were four CPUs that shared one memory space and they all talked to each other that way. Um, that was a high performance computing setup. 
this one's actually run on PCs and uh, digital equipment, uh, mini computers or workstations, and they talk with other systems to do control simulation communications. They would track, say, a piece of steel from the caster into the furnace, then to the rolling mill, then to the yards that would all be hooked to orders and things like that, the scrap yard that's feeding the uh, melters and so on. So there's a whole continuum there. And I think the last uh, architecture consideration is deterministic versus stochastic. So if you uh, apply a certain amount of heat to a piece of steel, it does the same thing every time the same way. No mystery to it. Well, when you get into human actions and things that are variable, then uh, you say, okay, how long did this take? And you put a random variation in it. And that's actually called Monte Carlo simulation for obvious reasons. You probably do that in traffic simulation. So um, imagine if, if you have just one variable that's random, might not be a big deal. But if you have a whole bunch of them stacked up on top of each other, that's when it gets interesting. You can get, uh, many times you'll get sort of a standard result, but you can get really good results if everything falls together just right, or really bad results if everything falls together wrong. So usually the way these are um, evaluating is we make a certain threshold of result X percent of the time. For example, a border crossing, they'll size it so there's no more than a 15 minute wait 85% of the time. And sometimes you don't want bad holiday things go wrong, you're toast, you're gonna have to wait. But uh, you can always make things faster, but you don't want to necessarily design for the worst case scenario. So I have an example here. Uh, imagine you're driving to work. You know, your car could break down, the weather could change, and people can pull out in front of you. There could be potholes. A bridge could go out, it could snow. All these things are random. And so your commute might be 20 minutes or it could be an hour. And there's gonna be a sort of results curve that's gonna show that. And uh, when you're doing stochastic stuff, you usually run multiple iterations of it. Whereas deterministic things, you only have to do one. So here are some examples uh, of different results you can get that drive the random number function. And these are sort of uh, fixed based on the concept of dice but you can imagine actually collecting data to, to see what those curves actually look like. So here's a model predictive control. Um, those are tunnel furnaces. It's a two-line swiveling tunnel furnace. This is in uh, Hanbo uh, Corporation in South Korea. So I went, uh, wrote this bottle and installed it. There are two casters, they work slow. One rolling mill, it works fast. 
These things are over 800 feet long. They process slabs that are 150 feet long. So they're big. And uh, those, um, there's a section that swivels. So uh, the slab going into the second furnace will go all the way to the end, then transfer back into this swiveling furnace, and then go to the rolling mill. And I have an animation of that. Now, what makes this predictive is every three seconds, it would not only update the current temperature, it would simulate the, what would happen if I left everything the same, all the settings, speeds, temperature, and so on, as those pieces go out of the furnace. And if they go out of the furnace at the right temperature, I don't change anything. If they don't, then I do change something. And that's the, those are the control variables. So here's an actual funny example. That's a um, shuttle furnace instead of a swiveling. I wrote these in Turbo Pascal like seven back in the 90s. And obviously it's somewhat interactive because uh, I can stop the simulation, change these control variables and see what will happen. So I did operations research with this. Mm -hmm. So here's the other context to uh, trial run the automating thing. Um, like I said in the beginning, um, a lot of times, especially in early days, they didn't have enough resources, computer power, anything else to do these simulations. When we were doing uh, power plant simulations in the early 90s, uh, the computers were pretty good. They do IL amazingly. But um, of these four CPUs they had that would share memory, they would each run a number of subroutines, right? Someone run the one that had to read the panels, might run 32 times a second. Uh, fluid models would run anywhere from four times a second, sometimes two, sometimes one. And that was troublesome. Now, at that time, you could write down the differential equations, linearize them, put them in, make them fairly efficient. Back in that series of blog posts, I talk about how um, things can be laid into a matrix and solved really efficiently. But before computers got powerful enough to do that, they would say, okay, this pump curve is something that goes into the matrix they would simulate that not as a curve, but as two line segments. Mm -hmm. And that's pressure versus flow. And there are some other information uh, too. The other thing you can do is um, decide how much to break down a problem. If I'm doing a continuous simulation, Let's say I break a piece of steel down into a million nodes, right? That might be more accurate than if I did 25, but it's also going to take a lot more power to do. So you have to decide what's the correct level of granularity to be accurate. Um, that takes memory. You also have to be able to get good input data. 
So a few things, you have to be able to uh, have balanced behavioral data. If you think of uh, these global weather simulations, what do you need to know to really make those accurate? You have to know every coefficient. Um, let's say for the nodes on the ground and in the atmosphere near the ground, you need to know the porosity of the ground, um, the type of ground cover, reflectivity, um, density, elevation, so many things. And the question is, people doing these simulations, do you think they have all that information for every square foot of the globe? And the answer is, of course not. It's ridiculous. So that's a source of error there. Um, when you're simulating economic things, um, you can do human behavior if the, their decisions are limited. So if you can simulate everything they're doing, if they're evacuating from a building, they can go down a corridor, they can go left or right, up or down stairs, out a door, not much they can do. But if you're saying, what are they gonna do in the economy? They can substitute anything, they can choose labor, you can never get full pain on everything people can do. So those are shortcomings of those kind of simulations. And obviously you have to be able to generate outputs you can use. So if we're gonna simulate an atom, or some of these things, uh, quantities and activities we'd have to consider. Hmm. Well, behavior. <laughs> yeah. So how does it behave around other, you know, positive or negative behavior, electrons, mm -hmm. positrons, and so forth? Okay. Um, Even yeah. what format you're going to do? Is it going to yeah. be 2D or 3D? Yeah, or, exactly. Right. You know, does the output if you don't have the output right, you're not getting anywhere. Right. What are the characteristics that an atom and its parts of atoms have? Well, do they take up space? Well, elect <laughs> where, where the electron is, yeah. in yeah. orbit, or probability. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, well that's like in pop. Masses, <laughs> spins, right. flavors, charms, yeah. um, <laughs> momentum. All position that. for every yeah. um, particle. And also the environment. Yeah, yes. all those things right. are true. Now, if I'm simulating that in a computer, think of the number of atoms mm -hmm. I need in each uh, bit of memory and how many bits I need to represent all that. So that gives us a limit on what we can simulate. We can't simulate the whole universe because it's an analog simulation of itself. Now, it may be a simulation running on a big computer at a higher level of some kind, but as far as we can tell, there are you also get into chaos theory, digital rounding errors, and a lot of other things that can go on. So there, what if we were going to simulate the entire universe? Can't do it from within the universe. Has anyone read the book Accelerando? It's a science fiction novel by Charles Strauss. Um, he talks about the uh, granularity of a simulation by quoting a Planck length. And a uh, Planck length is a stupidly small unit of measure. Um, you can, 
it's divine technically has the skill which quantum gravitational fluctuation should become apparent. And he said, well, in this little pocket universe, these aliens made for this guy that's being held in this simulation, it has a plank leg that's much longer, still stupidly is small, uh, in our sort of real life or engineering terms. But in terms of that, um, you know, it gives you an idea of the granularity. And it was uh, a shorthand way for the writer to express that concept. Alright, if you're going to build a simulator, first of all, or a simulation, first of all, you have to know what it is you're simulating. Yeah, uh, and the process of finding out the items and the actions is discovery. That's where you get your nouns and verbs. And then you do, uh, once you know what you have to deal with. Then you do data collection to quantify or characterize it all. And from that you can say this is important. I need to include it. And this can be neglected because the effects are small. To me, knowledge acquisition is talking to the subject matter experts really understand the thing you're simulating. So um, you uh, know what to add to do the discovery, you know what data collection to do, and you cyclically review your findings with them until everyone agrees. Um, so process mapping, I'll just, uh, instead of doing the words, these are all process maps I've done at various times. That's a paper mill in Quebec City. That'd be a continuous simulation. It's based on industry standards. It shows the state of the material flowing through the system. Um, some idea of sizes, equipment types, control systems, and so on. That one is a uh, off-gas system of a nuclear power plant. Again, a continuous uh, simulation. It, there are 50 or 60 of these in a power plant of varying complexity. So it's a big undertaking to build one of these. They used to run on the giant meters, and now they run on like two desktops. It's crazy. <laughs> that is a traffic simulation of the activity and border crossing. So this is the U.S. side of the border in Columbus, New Mexico. Um, you've got privately owned vehicles on this side, commercial vehicles on this side, and I think there are pedestrians in the middle. That is a discrete event simulation. And that's a study I did in preparation for building my own simulation framework to determine what I need. I did about 40 of those. Any individual process within a simulation, any volume, any um, item, any workstation, anything, um, can have a lot of things go into it now, don't it? You can either look uh, forwards to say if I get an input, mix them together, process them, whatever. 
um, then drive once the output going to be. And if I'm trying to hit a given target, I might work backwards and say, what's the output I want? When do I need to get there? So that's SciPod versus COVID, same thing. Those are the um, standard items I defined for uh, my simulation framework. <coughs> Entries, entities, processes, groups of processes. They're sometimes called a facility. So, uh, primary inspection and a border crossing might have 10 rules. They might be specialized, they might be open at different times, but they're all part of primary inspection. There are queues, bags, pads, exits, and so on. After that, you have to figure out um, how to design what you're actually going to run. So we talked about that before. Uh, then you have to implement it, then you have to test it. Here you have to know the difference between verification and validation. And verification is, I tried to do something, does that work? Validation is, did the thing I built, is that the right thing? And there's a major difference there. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Do you, who, who is your, who are your clients mainly now? Similar? Um, basically I'm a Business in Okay, that's what. Yeah. So you contract out to medical them. stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. Theme parks. Oh, any my. business. Okay. So. Very interesting. Well, good luck to you, Bob. Thank you. Welcome to the any, party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you have any questions, I have cards and so on. Yeah, card friends. Right. I've been fortunate enough to be involved with that and basically you have to be really good at what you do. Yes. You yeah. know, you have yeah. to actually have experience in the industry. Right. You have to That's right. Yeah. Actually work yourself up through the ranks and work for machinery or whatever. But the I think the most unique simulation was the New York City uh, Museum of Art. They had a, a giant atrium ah, that yeah. was built like a swamp. Ah. Okay, and in the middle of it was an inflatable tube that looked like a lily pad, oh. and you could jump in it, and the and the frogs and the worms oh, and everything were projected up. And if you walked up to the wall, the frog would bite you. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a fun thing, you know. Was. But but uh, Would you like yeah, to thank you. I remember, and all oh, the sounds like fun. croaking and everything. Yes. I'm not enough. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. A lot of them are pretty mundane, you know, like stress analysis or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. 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 But hey, um, you know, even things. These are running shoes, and they're all simulated. Yes, that's right. Work. That's right. I've never been injured. Well, you know, I had just Bob. You might find this interesting. I go to my ophthalmologist in a dilemma. I say, gee, you know, that blah, 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 recommended I do a, for cataracts. Uh -huh. I do a monofocal far in one eye and, you know, the, near the other. Gee, yeah. I don't know what to do. He says, well, why don't you just simulate with contact lenses? Uh -huh. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but I typically spend well over a year. One of them took me three years. Yeah, because you get into it, you write yeah. the oh, yeah. code, and it gets very you know, detailed, and you don't know what's in it. My boss will let me. Yeah, hey, very, very detailed. How you doing? I don't know. Can you show me what you're doing? No, because <laughs> every little part of my program needs to be finished. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you know, it's like blind trust. Jesus, I can't hope you're going to get this thing working someday. <laughs> you know, 
because you're missing one part yeah. in the simulation. Well, that's why in the early days in coding, they used to do stubbing. So you, they, yeah. you had to figure out right. how can I get the minimum built, you know, and that was before yeah. you had APIs I, and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah. Stimulation. Yeah. Yes. So I had yes. a very forgiving boss. I wrote code for like almost two and a half, three years. And it worked. Well, there you go. <laughs> but he had to take blind trust. That I hope right. this guy knows what he's doing. You know, because yeah. you know, I could show him all the equations. He says, "Well, what does that do?" Yeah. I said, "Well, that's the modeling for that." Well, no, that's the modeling for that. I, I I remember it was quite an insight when I learned in IT that people always thought that the purpose of a prototype was to sort of dis, you know what can I say? Well, Get a feeling for what it's going to be like. But actually, what it often does is. It gives you the acquire what you really should have asked for, because yeah. it well, makes yeah, it makes before. concrete. I'll, I'll make know, a physical model. You know model. what might only be ideational. Yeah, so. I'll make a physical model of what I'm right. going to do. And that that often gets you know, it's often not the answer. It prompts the requirements. Right. Rather right. than rather than being a solution, it's. Not know exactly. He knows he, he knows he needs a simulation of yeah. something, a model yes. of something, but right. He doesn't really know. Often you don't. Because yeah. he's a businessman and not an engineer that knows right. the nitty gritty details. Right. You need so that go between. Yes. Um, yeah. That knows how to talk to developers and exactly. do the right. simulation. Exactly. Talk to the so business, instance, business side. I might have yeah. simulated a mouse. Right. You know, it, in my mind, I simulated a mouse and I, I, I made a just a thing out of plastic, yeah. you know, to show them, well, this is about the size it's going to be, and this is the wire that's coming out of it. He says, oh, no, I didn't really want that. Yeah, exactly. You know, before it's been months exactly. designing a computer mouse or something, yeah. Well,